In this series, I've traveled across the continent and down the centuries, from the Renaissance to the French Revolution, to understand just why so little of the art on display is by women. Time and time again, ambitious female artists found their path blocked, tied to the home, starved of training. Only a handful of tenacious and resourceful women broke through to scorch a trail for posterity. But finally, in the middle of the 19th century, here in Britain, it looked as if all that was set to change. In 1842, the government opened its very first female school of design, right next to the men's, here in Somerset House. What a breakthrough after centuries of disapproval. Women finally painting and learning alongside their male contemporaries. Well, not quite. Just six years after it opened, the female school was moved to the other side of the Strand. An area then infamous for pornographic bookshops and unsavory pubs. As a journalist in 1851, Riley noted, if a paternal government had studied to select the worst possible place for such a school, they could not have more completely succeeded. The message was crystal clear. Female artistry did not warrant the prestige of male. Women were segregated, officially second class. But whatever the art establishment believed, society was changing fast. With women pressing on the door of the universities, the professions and parliament. In a galaxy of exploding potential, women were flowering in even more adventurous ways. As photographers, as sculptors, as architects. I have chosen just six. Six women who, in unique ways, have transformed our vision of the world. Over the centuries, there was one genre of painting that had remained the ultimate masculine stronghold, war art, and rarely with more pomposity than in the Age of Empire. But what would happen when a female artist decided to join the fray? The battlefield reeked of testosterone. Any artist who wanted to capture its visceral glory needed an iron stomach and an imperviousness that angelic Victorian women were seen to lack. And yet, it was a pupil of the fledgling female school of design who would become the most celebrated war artist of her time. Lady Butler was born simply Elizabeth Thompson in 1846 to a wealthy family. So pretty and delicate, there was no outward clue that she would grow up to be anything more than a textbook Victorian angel in the house. Unless you looked inside her sketchbooks, that is. This one, done when she was only 14. This is just the sort of thing you might imagine. A teenage girl of the mid-Victorian period to be producing. This is two women in a drawing room. It has a touch of little women about it. But as you go on, what this reveals to my utter amazement is even as a young teenager, she was preoccupied with history, with battles and with men. A bayonet charge, firing a pistol. Where on earth did this come from? Lady Butler couldn't account for it herself. She even reflected in her diary, how strange that I should be impregnated, if that's the right word, with the warrior spirit, given that there were no soldiers in either my mother or my father's family. What I see, even in these tiny sketches, is the unusual ambition of a young woman, even in something miniature, she's reaching after the male and the epic. Determined to further her ambitions, Butler, aged 19, enrolled herself in the new female school of design. 
writing in her diary on the eve of her first day. Ah, oh, they shall hear of me someday. That day dawned sooner than she could have imagined, when in 1874, Butler submitted one of her works to the Royal Academy. It was here, in this most male-dominated of arenas, that her art would provoke the most startling reaction. When the exhibition was open to the public, she caused a sensation. The painting was mobbed. The police had to be called. She reflected it in her diary that night. I awoke this morning and found myself famous. So famous, in fact, that just a few weeks later, the painting was bought by Queen Victoria herself. And today it hangs in pride of place, here in St James's Palace. It's known as the Roll Call, or to give it its more precise title, calling the roll after an engagement in the Crimea. This is not a celebration of noble heroism, Instead, it's a depiction of the costs of war for the ordinary soldiers. The carnage of the Crimean War some 20 years before was still raw in popular memory. Undeterred, Butler had chosen to expose the painful truth, ground in mud and gore. They are an absolute study in weariness and exhaustion is suffused with human emotion. The painting went on tour across the great northern cities and was mobbed wherever it went. Arguably, this is the painting that touched the Victorians like no other. It's an irony that a woman who was so effective in depicting the realities of war never actually saw a battlefield for herself. But Butler explained in her autobiography that a painter should be careful to keep a distance, to stop the vile details blinding them to the noble things that rise beyond. However, this distance has done nothing to diminish the impact of her work upon those who have experienced conflict firsthand. Butler wrote in her diary, I thank God that I only paint for the pathos and not the glory of war. Mm. If I had seen even the corner of one battlefield, I would never paint another war painting. Mm. But I think that makes her even more extraordinary. Mm. You've got to bear in mind that Butler was probably the first artist to actually bring the human, soldiering, individual face mm. of conflict onto the canvas. Butler didn't go to the Crimea, but you've been to Helmand and Afghanistan. Well, I have drawn enormous inspiration from her work because I think she, as a woman, was really trying to do exactly what I'm trying to do, which is, which is make the public aware of the reality of soldiering and the individual and the human being. Butler's sensitive depictions of the humble soldier saw her dubbed the Florence Nightingale of the brush. But characteristically, she didn't want to be cast as merely a sensitive female artist. If her male contemporaries captured the drama and violence of warfare, then so would she. A royal commission to paint the army's last stand against the Zulu at Rourke's Drift would test her ability to capture action to its limit. As a woman with no experience of war, could she rise to the challenge? I think it's something to do with her natural ability as an artist. You feel this battle, you feel the moment so how did a female artist achieve something like this? Because we know she never went to the front. The way she did that was actually to go to Portsmouth, where the army were stationed, and see people who were here at this event, and they reenacted it for her. So realistically, they put on their uniforms and they acted it out. So she was making sure every button, every colour was exactly right, as well as the expressions on the faces. 
I think that's the exciting thing about Lady Butler. It's a bit for me like today, a female director making an action movie, saying, I'm not going to do a romantic comedy, I'm not going to play on those stereotypes. And she gets to the heart of the matter and she gives us this action piece. This is what we think of as a history painting, really. I really like that you use that phrase, history, history painting. That's the thing. That's what great artists were supposed to be creating, history paintings. Female artists, well, they could do flower paintings. They could do portraits or landscapes. But to do this real bare-knuckle history painting stuff, it wasn't thought to be the stuff of ladies. And yet Lady Butler is able to do it. <laughs> Determined that her work would be as authentic as possible, she restaged cavalry charges, bravely standing before thundering hooves. She wrote, I twice saw a charge of the Greys before painting Scotland Forever, and I stood in front to see them coming on. Lady Butler's art began to overturn centuries of prejudice. She even forced the critic John Ruskin who believed that no woman could paint, to eat his words and marvel, this is Amazon's work. Butler had triumphed on her own terms in the genre most esteemed by the art establishment.